welcome direct from the cozy confines of my movie studio apartment ensconced comfortably right here in the wood of the holly that's the hollywood hills underneath the sign welcome to episode number three of bill k that's me that's right bill k's cockeyed caravan this is my podcast for friends and family actually family and friends and then hopefully some friends of friends and maybe it will leak out into the larger culture but either way it's my discourse uh on everything and nothing i'm kind of taking a look into the back uh, waters of my brain and hopefully i can shed a little light into yours so hey it's uh what's the date it's monday july 9th we've just uh survived what really wasn't Independence Day, but really felt more like Independence Week. We had a big scorcher in L.A., and for those of you um, that don't believe that uh, global warming is upon us, I wanted to remind you also that the Earth is flat, that the um, sun revolves around the Earth, and the Milky Way around the sun, and the sky is not blue, and uh, DNA doesn't exist, and all those other things, because we had a scorcher. I, I literally couldn't sleep in my bed because the air conditioning uh, really was uh, just a, a feeble answer to the heat. And I don't know if you can hear it outside the walls of the cozy confines of uh, my movie studio apartment, but I can hear the ubiquitous sound of leaf blower to be sure operated by a trusty Latin American immigrant who crossed the border uh, for sure uh, after considerable effort and risk so that he can uh, look after the uh, beauty of our pleasant surroundings here. I've often wondered, you know, there's really one answer to this assault on immigration and immigrants in general, and that is a general strike because... um, If for just a week our Latin American brothers and sisters who have come here to Southern California, those worthwhile invisibles, if they were for just one week (laughs) stop uh, what they were doing, uh, where would our food be? Who would be raising our kids? Uh, The gardens would be overgrown. The plates would not be bust. The food would not be, uh, the plate, the the plates wouldn't be bust. They wouldn't be cleaned. Basically, our whole society, as we know, would come to a screeching halt. They make our world run. And they, for, uh, who picks our food? Um, It's, it's kind of a, you know, they're invisibles in a way. So much of our world just runs on their labor and we're, they're taking for granted and now they're not even taken for granted they're under a nazi-like assault from the pvp and for those of you that haven't uh joined the cockeyed caravan before the pvp is uh putin's vice president and the putin actually uh will be meeting his vice president today or not today but this week and that's on the national agenda which should be interesting if not tragic uh to see the PVP who is beholden so much to his boss. Uh, There is no question in my mind that he is as beholden to Putin as the undertaker was to Don Corleone. I mean, uh, that's basically what we have here. Uh, The the ex-communists for sure make the best capitalists, and some of those capitalists... Um, make terrific gangsters and what we have here in Washington uh, occupying the egg like office is a a red haired blue eyed gangster Um, I've often wondered you know what was the the earth out of which this weed this grew and basically he came out of a world which was filled with gangsters, um, real estate and queens. Uh, <laughs> it's about might makes right and bullying, and that's the fertilizer out of which he emerged. But it needed another agree- uh, ingredient uh, to get to where it is now. And that is, to me, well, it's one thing. It's celebrity. But for that TV show, but for his relentless pursuit of attention, Um, over the decades, he he would not have been within a million miles of uh, the American presidency. And so to me, that speaks to kind of almost a biblical issue, which is when you worship false idols, 
you get false gods. And what, you know, our, our society is addled by the worship of false gods. And the, and the biggest and most obvious one to me is the worship of celebrity. I mean, I live in the Mecca. I'm underneath the sign, which is <laughs> the holiest monument to celebrity. That's Hollywood, um, where, you know, uh, fame trumps achievement, uh, bombast over wisdom, and where, for sure, uh, conventional wisdom is not wisdom. That is my core belief, and I hope that animates uh you know, what this podcast and my little rant is about. So what's else going on in our world? Oh, hmm. how does a soccer team end up underneath a mountain? I don't get that in Thailand. That's sort of a mystery to me. I mean, they should have just been watching the World Cup on television, but instead they uh, found themselves under a mountain in Thailand. And I, it's, you know, when people fall in holes, it's, it's somehow it's like the magic for celebrity. I mean, I hope these kids get out. I understand they're, they're being extracted as I speak. But I couldn't help but remember uh, one of my favorite but li- almost least known of the Billy Wilder uh, movies, and that's Ace in the Hole with Kirk Douglas, where uh, uh, some people are lost in a, in a mining hole in the American Southwest, and it creates a media sensation. And um, Kirk Douglas is a journalist who's feeding on the frenzy and, you know, and he's a careerist. So great Billy Wilder movie. The thing about Billy Wilder is he made a lot of movies, you know, that were great that few, you know, have never seen. Um, you know, most notably to me is, if, if, well, here's one, like I mentioned, uh, Ace in the Hole with Kirk Douglas. But then there's Kiss Me Stupid, a great comedy. And I think probably... You know, there's two movies that sort of bookend his career pretty much, not completely. One is uh, Ninochka, which he wrote, did not direct. I believe George Cukor directed it. But that was a love affair between a French capitalist or American capitalist in France and Greta Garbo, um, the title of the movie, Ninochka. Really funny, great. Uh, American comedy, something that probably couldn't be written or produced or even conceived today. And then bookended by a movie at the very end of his career, which starred Jimmy Cagney, uh, which was also a kind of Cold War madcap comedy, really worth seeing, um, that featured an American capitalist in Berlin, uh, where the wall was, and that was one, two, three. So two... uh, Billy Wilder classics. I credit him with Nanachka since he wrote it, and then one, and then uh, Ace in the Hole, or rather Ace in the Hole in the middle, uh, referencing the uh, the Thai <laughs> soccer team's uh, adventure, and then ended by one, two, three. Uh, that was that was Jimmy Cagney's last movie until he showed up decades later in Ragtime. So, uh, shout out and a tribute to one of the great masters of the cinema, one of the great geniuses, one of my heroes, Billy Wilder. And of course, that's not to mention the greatest movie ever made, in my view, about Hollywood, and that's Sunset Boulevard, and then, oh God, The Fortune Cookie, uh, there's so many. Uh, and he, you know, he kind of dabbled in so many genres. He didn't actually dabble. He sort of invented many genres, especially noir, um, you know, the James Cain novels. Um, Double Indemnity, also one of my faves. Another movie that was uh, took place right here in Southern California in Hollywood. So what's up on my mind? I'm still struggling um, trying to make sense of that great Goodwill ambassador, um, Anthony Bourdain. I'm reading his one of his other books right now, um, his adventures. It's, it's, it, it reads a little bit like one of his CNN episodes, except, you know, it's a little more um, caustic. And I think... You know, reading somebody posthumously lends a different meaning to when you read them and they're alive and they're on television promoting. When they're speaking to you from the other side, from the back of beyond, their books take on a a different meaning, especially in the social moment that we're in. And, you know, this guy was such a, you know, fantastic friggin' ambassador. You know, he was, he, he, he never really censored himself, especially in his books, and he was, in his own way, you know, this multicultural, 
uh, explorer, this, this cross-cultural adventurer, this guy who used food as a medium to, uh, and cuisine as a medium to understand other culture. And it was always about him putting himself in, in, in the, um, the foreigner's shoes, you know, in, 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 the, in the Russian restaurant or, you know, in the Vietnam, Vietnamese market. And to me, he was sort of the anti-PVP because rather than building walls, he was, you know, I hate to be trite, but he was out there crossing bridges and this incredible, hip, cool, you know, American ambassador and sharing that not only with us, but the people that he met around the world. And it just feels like the PVP is is the anti-expression of that. He's a, he wants to build walls. And let me say this. If he does build that wall, what I want to know is how the fuck am I going to get out? Okay, that's my core question. Um, and, of course, looming on the very near horizon, if we're going to talk about politics and news, and seems like that's just where the gravity of my mind seems to go because of the social moment that we're in. But we're going to be... Um, offered a new Supreme Court nominee and uh, within, I think, today. And now they're getting, seemingly these nominees are getting younger and younger because the, or their term is their life. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if he nominates like a 12-year-old, a prepubescent um, conservative kid somewhere who could perhaps occupy the Supreme Court for the next 65 years. Uh but we'll see what happens today. And, of course, it sets the stage for what really could be the climactic uh, battle um, as Roe v. Wade uh, and its future looms on the horizon. Will it indeed uh, survive if he's able to nominate and get confirmed a new Supreme Court justice? Uh, I know my women friends are freaked out. And so am I. Um, the hopeful side of myself thinks that um, if they choose to revisit that and overturn it, it will be a massive political overreach that will probably betray itself, at least on the political side. I can't imagine, um, was it nine justices, uh, nine people overturning the majority will of you know, millions upon millions of people, but it could happen, and worse things have. And the Supreme Court, you know, in our own lifetime, my own lifetime, for the most part, has, you know, helped push that arc of social justice forward. But if you look before 1954, it wasn't always the case. All you have to think back to is Plessy Ferguson, which was the Supreme Court decision that affirmed segregation and codified into American law the idea that separate was equal. And, of course, that was later overturned in 1954, uh, Brown v. Board. And then before that, you know, notably, there was, of course, uh, the Dred Scott decision, the pre-Civil War decision that affirmed black men as property. So... There is no guarantee that um, we're on this gentle arc towards improved fairness in our world, and we're likely for a rocky ride into the future. I'm not, I've lost my face in prognostication after the last selection. I use selection as opposed to election because I, I don't believe it was f a, a fair contest. Um, I agree with the PVP that it was indeed rigged. Um, many factors leading up to it, um, but I don't. It's just not. It doesn't. It doesn't feel real. So I just lost my faith in my. I always had a pretty good sense that I had a feeling for the way things would go uh, politically in elections, but or see. But in this election, uh, I was wrong. <laughs> I'll never forget that night I was hosting a show at the Laugh Factory and um, the word, you know, was passed on to me on stage that the selection had indeed been called for the PVP and 
there was such a stunned, horrific silence that just felt fell across that room, and I, I didn't even know what to say. I, I felt like part grief counselor and part comedian, um, and I. <laughs> I think the grief counseling part of the project definitely outweighed the um, the comedy side, and we're living with those results to this very day. Um, what's on my mind? What else have I been reading? I want to get into this, maybe not on this podcast, but certainly uh, in subsequent ones. I, I was recently able to read, I, was, I read W.E.B. Du Bois' uh, Black reconstruction in america and that's uh, you know it was a um, something i was referred to from some other reading and for those of you who don't know w.e.b du bois i think is the proper way to say it w.e.b du bois um was an african-american scholar and uh was i think the first uh black guy to go to harvard where he got a phd in history and was one of the founders of the naacp and he lived in the and wrote uh, an influence, to be sure, in the first half of uh, the 20th century. And he was prolific in his writings. And he wrote Black Reconstruction in America. I recommend it, um, although I don't think it's a particularly fun read. It's somewhat pedantic, but it's probably the most thorough examination of the period of time uh, immediately after the Civil War known as Reconstruction. And he... he wrote that book to sort of, in his mind, set the record straight because the prevailing um, mythology about Reconstruction was that it was an incredible disaster, that it was a period dominated by black misrule, incompetence, and corruption. And uh, that was sort of the prevailing... I don't know, belief about about that period of time, when in fact there's really a much more powerful narrative at play, which he, um, you know, describes in a lot of detail. Firstly, the Civil War. Um, according to Du Bois, and I tend to believe it, the Civil War was being, you know, fought or contested to almost a stalemate, practically, uh, you know, in the first two or three years. Uh, it was Confederate victory after Confederate victory, um, on the battlefield, Lincoln was uh, flipping out generals like Steinbrenner, flipped out baseball managers. I was unable to really find um, a formula to prevail in the war. And when in 1863 he issued the proclamation, Emancipation Proclamation, as, as the battles, as the word began to filter across the South, uh, black people, slaves, uh, bondsmen, uh, began to stop working, uh, abandon the plantation, and effect a kind of disorganized general strike, which uh, basically cut off the food supply to the Confederate Army. And um, in addition, as the Union armies began to press in, they joined the ranks of the military. And uh, there were you know, many black regiments and by the hundreds of thousands. And at the same time as this was going on, as black men were filling the ranks of the Union Army, uh, white Northerners were rioting in the streets of New York City over the draft. And so there was a shortfall of white manpower, which was filled in generously and heroically by um, recently uh, liberated black uh, former slaves. So in, in Du Bois' mind, that really altered the the balance in the war and assured um, <clears throat> the victory, you know, for the for the North. Um, you know, so often in our history, you know, that that those victories has have been ascribed to the generals, whether it was you know famously Ulysses S. Grant, <coughs> excuse me, and I, and I think you know they do deserve credit, but the critical balance was what you know the influx of African American soldiers, the abandonment of plantations, which force the confederate side to either like uh, white people had to go back and um, tend their own farms or starve so so that was critical but that was the preamble to uh, reconstruction and in the 10 years that followed um it was a period of you know massive social participation by black people and this was uh, there was an incredible desire 
one uh, to enjoy the full rights of citizenship, to get um, educated, to become literate. There were um, there was created the Freedmen's Bureau, which was a precursor to some of those administrations that we saw during the Depression, because it was a short-lived federal um, uh, bureau that extended. Um, in some cases, land, resources, advice, schools, education to recently free black people to help integrate them into society and help them participate in this democracy. And it was just like um, there were all kinds of political conventions and just a massive effort by the black people to participate. And so on one level, it was actually an incredibly hopeful period. And whilst this was going on, the former plantation owners, the oligarchs, if you will, of the South, were amassing and organizing. And former Confederate officers began a period of terrorism. Nathan Bedford Forrest, who was a Confederate cavalry officer, um, founded the Ku Klux Klan. And that began sort of the terrorist regime that ultimately beat back the progress that was made during Reconstruction. And ultimately, the northern armies withdrew from the south after about 10 years. And the Black Codes, which later became known as Jim Crow, were put into place. And slavery uh, came to exist, really, by another name. And it became, you know, a difficult, tragic I don't know, another hundred years almost, uh, for uh, three or four more generations um, of hopelessness in the South uh, when respect to voting rights, um, land ownership. And I think the core tragedy was when there was no compensation, no restorative justice uh, for freed slaves. By that I mean the, 40, the promise of 40 acres and a mule, which was made by a military general, was never extended uh, by the federal government at large. And so all these um, former slaves w were were landless and forced into tenant farming and just had no economic uh, foothold, you know, and basically enslaved them for another almost 80, 90, 100 years. And even to this day, we're seeing the results. So that tragic oversight of, I don't think oversight's the right word, but when there was no compensation uh, for the people who had worked on these farms for generation by way of land and fertilizer and livestock. That was a disaster, and, and the former plantation owners were able to maintain control of the land and the government, and, um, uh, and they had the, the terrorist arm of the Ku Klux Klan to kind of use fear as the... Um, as the main weapon to ensure the results that they chose. In spite of that, though, the 13th and the 14th and the 15th Amendment were passed and ratified to the Constitution, and the 13th abolished slavery. The 14th uh, defined, uh, you know, embraced citizenship for all um, former slaves, people born in the United States, and famously... Uh, guaranteed equal protection under the law. And finally, the 15th Amendment uh, guaranteed voting rights in the Constitution. Now, it was great. They made it into the Constitution. They were ratified largely because federal armies were still occupying southern states and legislatures. But it was these rights were codified into the Constitution, but they were really dead-letter promises and... They really, those promises are still to, well, they're still under assault, but they've been, they were largely unfulfilled for, I don't know, maybe a hundred years. So it's worth revisiting if you can, uh, reading the 13th and 14th and 15th amendments. They, um, really, um, were promises, American promises that have, are still largely unfulfilled and, um, all worth reading if you get a chance to check out W.E.B. Du Bois' uh, Black Reconstruction in America. And I'm rambling about history and politics and Supreme Court justices and global warming and Anthony Bourdain and, geez, my little life and 
I'm about 25 minutes into this rant, and so it goes where it takes me. It doesn't really get planned, and hopefully in the future when I get some more microphones and figure out this thing I'll, uh, a little bit better, I'll have some guests, and the shows will get longer. And for those of you that have huge gaps of time that you'd like to waste in your life, if you're revisiting you know, reruns of Gilligan Island on Hulu, you can maybe sacrifice some of that and join me on my cockeyed caravan thanks for tuning in on episode 3 this is Bill K signing off